The main purpose of transmission line tower is to hold the conductor, which is transmitting the power from generating station to distribution end. As the conductors are bare and carrying the power at high voltage need to hold it at required height as per statutory requirements moreover the structure shall be safe, reliable and shall withstand all the climatic loads during the expected life of line. A transmission tower, also known as an electricity pylon or simply a pylon in British English and as a hydro tower in Canadian English, is a tall structure, usually a steel lattice tower, used to support an overhead power line. Transmission towers support the high voltage conductors of overhead power lines from the generating station switchyard right up to the source substations and satellite substations located near populated areas. Their shape, height and sturdiness mechanical strength depend on the stresses to which they are exposed. Towers do not transmit electricity themselves unless lightning strikes the ground wire strung along the top of the structure. This cable is designed to protect conductors by allowing lightning discharges to reach the ground through the tower. Types of transmission line. In transmission line determina determination of voltage drop, transmission efficiency, line loss etc. are important things to design. These values are affected by line parameter R, KEL and C of the transmission line. Lengthwise transmission lines are three types. Short transmission line. A short transmission line is classified as a transmission line with a length less than 80 kilometers or 50 miles, voltage level less than 69 kV, capacitance effect is negligible, only resistance and inductance are taken in calculation capacitance is neglected. Medium transmission line. A medium transmission line is classified as a transmission line with a length more than 80 kilometers or 50 miles but less than 250 kilometers or 150 miles. Operational voltage level is from 69 kV to approximate 133 kV. Capacitance effect is present. Distributed capacitance form is used for calculation purpose. Long transmission line. A long transmission line is classified as a transmission line with a length more than 250 kilometers or 150 miles. Voltage level is above 133 kV. Line constants are considered as distributed over the length of the line. Transmission towers, electrical pylons carry large amounts of high voltage current over long dist distances. These structures typically stand 50 to 150 feet tall, 16M to 45M, with the tallest towers being 1,247 feet or 380M tall. Transmission towers connect power plants to a series of substations, which allows one bulk power region of the grid to connect to another. Higher voltages on power lines require space between each line and other objects, allowing people, vehicles, and other equipment to move freely beneath. The tower's live conductors are supported by insulators, the length of which increases with the increasing voltage of the circuit. For this reason, transmission towers usually stand 50 feet to 150 feet high, 16M to 45M, or higher if spanning waterways or other natural chasms. Most tower structures are manufactured from steel, but some are manufactured from concrete, wood, or even ductile iron. Wooden distribution poles, found in local neighborhoods unless using underground power lines, are generally about 40 feet 12 m tall. Transmission voltages are usually between 23,000 volts to 765,000 volts. Transmission tower conductors are usually manufactured from steel reinforced aluminium cable ACSR aluminium conductor steel reinforced and are almost always arranged in sets of three for three phase alternating current transmission. A fourth neutral cable may be used for transmission over short distances, but this is not common. Conductors are grouped by phase. There could be one, one conductor line per group three total, two conductor lines per group six total, or more. Groups are installed in multiples of 3 i.e. 3, 6, 9, and may be arranged in a triangular shape or parallel to each other. Three-way grouping increases transmission efficiency. However, if you look at the top of a transmission tower, you may see one or two smaller, solitary wires. These wires have several names, overhead ground wire, static wire, or pilot wire, but all describe the same wire. An overhead ground wire static wire pilot wire absorbs or deflects lightning strikes, conveying electricity safely to the ground. Under normal conditions, the overhead wire does not carry electricity its voltage potential is zero. Some overhead ground wires are grouped with fiber optic cables that convey telecommunication data. Essentially made of glass, fiber optic cables cannot conduct electricity and are not affected by light lightning strikes. Alternatively, you may notice fiber optics running a few feet 1M below transmission conductors. Adding telecommunication lines increases the return on investment associated with building transmission networks. 
Fiber optic lines may be operated by the utility or leased to cable or phone companies. The structures commonly used on transmission lines are either lattice type or pole type. Lattice structures are usually composed of steel angle sections. Poles can be wood, steel, or concrete. Each structure type may be self-supporting or guide supported by cables. Pole type structures are generally used for voltages of 345 kV or less, while lattice steel structures are favored for higher voltage levels. Wood pole structures can be economically used for relatively short transmission distances and lower voltages. The configuration of a transmission line tower depends upon many factors, some are listed below, the number and type of conductors. The length of the insulator assembly. The minimum clearance is to be maintained between, between conductors and the tower. The location of ground wires with respect to the outermost conductor. The mid-span clearance required considering the dynamic behavior of conductors and lightning protection of the line. The minimum clearance of the lowest conductor above ground level. The factors governing the height of a tower are minimum permissible ground clearance H1. Maximum sag H2. Vertical spacing between the top and bottom conductors H3. Vertical clearance between the ground wire and top conductor H4. The total height of tower is given by the sum of all four factors H1 plus H2 plus H3 plus H4. Tower configuration, depending upon the requirements of the transmission system, various line configurations must be considered ranging from single circuit horizontal to multi-circuit vertical structures, with single or V-strings in all phases, as well as any combination of these. Also, for very high voltages 500 kV and above, conductors are bundled to reduce corona emission and reduce line inductance. The configuration of a transmission line tower depends upon many factors, some of the most important are listed below, voltage, number of circuits, type of conductors, type of insulators, possible future addition of new circuits, tracing of transmission line, selection of tower sites, selection of rigid points, selection of conductor configuration, selection of height for each tower. Towers are classified according to their use, independent of the number of conductors they support. A tower must withstand mechanical loads from a range of directions e.g. straight, at an angle etc. To simplify tower design and ensure an overall economy in cost and maintenance, Tower designs are generally confined to a few standard types. Transmission tower types. There are several types of transmission tower in many variations, but they can be roughly grouped as suspension towers. Conductors are suspended between two towers using suspension insulators. Terminal towers. Conductors from a transmission line are connected to a substation or underground cable via a tower's strain insulators. Tension towers. The tower can cater for the weight of the cables and axial loading strain in a horizontal direction. Transposition towers The tower changes the position of the conductors on a transmission line relative to each other e.g. in position X, out position Y. There are too many tower variations to be discussed here, but some of the most common will now be discussed further. Suspension towers Tangent towers are used primarily on tangents but are often designed to withstand angles in the line only up to 2 degrees, in addition to wind, ice, and broken conductor loads. If the transmission line traverses relatively flat featureless terrain, 90% of the line may be composed of this type of tower. Thus, the design of tangent tower provides the greatest opportunity for the structural engineer to minimize the total weight of steel required for the transmission system. Angle towers, sometimes called semi-anchor towers, must resist transverse loads induced at an angle in addition to the usual wind, ice, and broken conductor loads. Angle towers are heavier than suspension towers by necessity. Angle towers are used when the line deviation exceeds an angle greater than 2 degree. They are classified as small angle towers 2 to 10 degrees line deviation. Medium angle towers 10 to 30 degrees line deviation. Large angle towers 30 to 60 degrees line deviation. Unlike suspension towers, tension towers use strain insulators to resist axial loading placed on the tower from the conductor's net tension acting on the tower. Dead-end towers anchor towers support the weight of the connecting conductors and cater for the tension in the conductors. This type of tower also uses strain insulators. Dead-end towers are typically used at the end of a tra transmission line before the line passes to a substation or underground line. Dead-end towers are often installed periodically between a series of suspension towers. This setup reduces the likelihood of a series of towers cascade failing can occur when a conductor on the transmission line fails. 
These are activities normally done on TL, survey, design and detailing, proto-manufacturing and assembly, testing, manufacturing and supply, construction and erection, stringing of line and commissioning. Transmission tower loads, the loads acting upon an electrical transmission tower are numerous and dynamic, some are listed below, dead load of tower. Dead load from conductors and other equipment. Load from snow on conductors and equipment. Ice load on the tower itself. Erection and maintenance loads. Wind load on the tower. Wind load on conductors and equipment. Loads from conductor tensile forces. Seismic activity loads earthquakes etc. The major load acting on a transmission tower arises from the conductors, and that the conductors behave like chains able to resist only tensile forces. Consequently, the dead load from the conductors is calculated by using the so-called weight span, which may be considerably different from the wind span used in connection with the wind load calculation. The average span length is usually chosen to be between 300 and 450 meters. meters. The occurrence of ice and snow etc. adds to the weight of the parts covered, and it increases their exposure to the effects of wind. Underestimation of these circumstances has frequently led to damage and collapse of transmission towers. The size and distribution of ice and snow loads depend upon the climate and local conditions. The wind force is usually assumed to be acting on a horizontal plane. However, depending on local conditions, a sloping direction may have to be considered. Also, different wind directions in the horizontal plane must be taken into account for the conductors as well as for the tower itself. The maximum wind velocity does not occur simultaneously along the entire span, so coefficients are introduced into load calculations to account for this. Tensile forces in the conductors act on the two faces of the tower in the line direction. If the forces are balanced, no longitudinal forces will act on a tower suspending a straight line. For angle towers, longitudinal forces result in a resultant force acting in the angle bisector plane. For terminal towers, the forces can cause heavy longitudinal resultant forces. As tensile forces vary with external loads, even suspension towers on a straight line are affected by longitudinal forces. The main supporting unit of overhead transmission line is transmission tower. Transmission towers have to carry the heavy transmission conductor at a sufficient safe height from ground. In addition to this, all towers have to sustain all kinds of natural stresses. Parts of a transmission tower, a power transmission tower consists of the following parts, peak of transmission tower, cross arm of transmission tower, boom of transmission tower, cage of transmission tower, transmission tower body, leg of transmission tower, stub anchor bolt and base plate assembly. Peak of transmission tower, the portion above the top cross arm is called peak of transmission tower. Generally, earth shield wire is connected to the tip of this peak. Cross arm of transmission tower hold the transmission conductor. The dimension of cross arm depends on the level of transmission voltage, configuration and minimum forming angle for stress distribution. Boom of transmission tower, boom is a rectangular beam of the cross section in a horizontal configuration tower. It is used to support transmission conductors in the horizontal configuration. Cage of transmission tower, the portion between tower body and peak is known as cage of transmission tower. This portion of the tower holds the cross arms. Trans transmission tower body, the portion from bottom cross arm up to the ground level is called transmission tower body. This portion of the tower plays a vital role for maintaining a required ground clearance of the bottom conductor of the transmission line. In electrical grids, they are generally used to carry high voltage transmission lines that transport bulk electric power from generating stations to electrical substations, Utility poles are used to support lower voltage sub-transmission and distribution lines that transport power from substations to electric customers. They come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes. Typical height ranges from 15 to 55 m, 49 to 180 feet, though the tallest are the 380 m, 1,247 foot towers of a 2,656 m, 8,714 foot span between the islands Jintang and Cixi in China's Zhejiang province. The longest span of any hydroelectric crossing ever built belongs to the power line crossing of Amaralik Fjord with a length of 5,376 m, 17,638 feet in addition to steel. Other materials may be used, including concrete and wood. Tower anatomy, peak, the function of peak is to support the ground wire. 
Cage, it comprises tower legs interconnected by bracings between peak and waist level. Cross arm, the function of cross arm is to support conductor. Tower body, tower body is the main portion of tower for connecting cage to tower foundation extension. Body extension, it is used to increase decrease the height of tower with a view to obtaining the required minimum ground clearance. Leg extensions are used either with any one leg or pair of legs at locations where footing of tower are at different levels. Gantry structures are used in power transmission substations, which are similar to power transmission towers in terms of design, materials, and production methods. A gantry is a gate-shaped metal structure that is used for the electrical connection of various equipment, especially the line-to-post connection. In gantry structures bridge plus column, the cable is transferred from the line to the substation structures and equipment. Testing for power transmission towers are critical components in the electrical grid, responsible for carrying high voltage power lines across vast distances. Ensuring their structural integrity, reliability, and longevity is paramount, especially given their exposure to diverse and often harsh environmental condition conditions. Comprehensive environmental and durability testing is essential to validate the performance and safety of these towers. This article delves into the various tests conducted to assess the environmental resilience and durability of power transmission towers. Environmental testing simulates the real-world conditions that power transmission towers face to ensure they can withstand extreme weather and environmental stressors. Corrosion testing, salt spray test, this test subjects tower components to a saline mist environment, replicating coastal and marine conditions to assess the corrosion resistance of materials and coatings. Humidity test, high humidity levels are used to test materials resistance to moisture-induced corrosion and degradation. Weather simulation testing, thermal cycling, materials undergo repeated heating and cooling cycles to simulate day-night temperature variations and seasonal changes, assessing their ability to handle thermal stress. UV exposure, prolonged exposure to ultraviolet light evaluates the degradation of non-metallic components and coatings. Acid rain test, simulated acid rain exposure, components are sprayed with acidic solutions to simulate acid rain conditions, testing the impact on materials and protective coatings. Wind load testing, wind tunnel testing, wind tunnels simulate high wind conditions to evaluate the structural response of the tower to gusts and sustained winds. Aeroelastic testing, this test studies the interaction between aerodynamic forces and structural flexibility to ensure stability under wind loading. Seismic testing, shake table testing, simulated earthquake conditions evaluate the tower's structural response to seismic activity, ensuring stability and integrity during earthquakes. Ice and snow load testing, ice accretion simulation, ice accumulation on the tower is simulated to evaluate structural integrity and performance under ice load conditions. Snow load testing, the impact of heavy snow loads on the tower's structure is assessed. Durability testing, ensures that power transmission towers can withstand long-term environmental exposure and operational loads. Accelerated aging tests, accelerated weathering, materials and coatings are subjected to intensified environmental conditions to predict long-term performance in a shorter time frame. Fatigue testing, cyclic loads are applied to assess the durability of materials and connections over the tower's expected lifespan. Material and coating durability, tensile and compressive strength tests, these tests evaluate the strength of materials to ensure they can withstand expected loads without failure. Adhesion tests, the adhesion strength of protective coatings is measured to ensure they remain intact and effective over time. Foundation durability testing, soil structure interaction tests, long-term interaction between the tower foundation and soil is assessed to ensure stability and prevent settlement issues. Foundation integrity monitoring, techniques like ground penetrating radar GPR detect subsurface issues or degradation over time. Load-bearing capacity tests, static load tests, static loads are applied to evaluate the structural capacity of the tower and its components. Dynamic load tests, dynamic loads simulate real-life conditions like wind and seismic activity. Structural health monitoring, long-term monitoring systems, sensors continuously monitor strain, stress, displacement, and vibrations to detect signs of degradation or structural issues over time. Periodic inspections and maintenance, regular inspections and maintenance are conducted based on monitoring data to ensure ongoing durability and performance.